what they had done was leave behind something that was so stupendous, so monstrously impressive. Who would have thought that beneath the shimmering waters of the Jordan River, secrets buried for millennia were waiting to be uncovered? A recent archaeological dive turned into a heart-stopping adventure when experts stumbled upon the unexpected. What stories could it tell us? And what does this hidden relic reveal about our distant ancestors? This is one of those discoveries that will make Joe Rogan sit and question for hours and say, hey, like, this, this defies yes. conventional explanation. As we probe the watery depths of history, we can't help but ask, what other mysteries might the Jordan River be keeping from us? The river, it seems, has a lot more to tell. You see, the Jordan River is not just any ordinary river. This 156-mile-long river, located in the Middle East, starts its journey flowing north to south cuts across the beautiful Sea of Galilee, and finally ends at the Dead Sea. This is not just a geographical marvel, but it also holds an incredibly special place in many religions. When you look at the journey of the Jordan River, you'll notice that it has two key parts, the upper course and the lower course. The upper course of the river is from where it begins until it reaches the Sea of Galilee. From the Sea of Galilee onward, until the river meets the Dead Sea, is considered the lower course. Now, one of the most exciting things about this river is its unique location. It doesn't just flow on flat ground, it flows in a structural depression, which means it's kind of sunken into the land. This makes it one of a kind because it's the lowest elevation river in the entire world. And that's not all. The journey of this river ends at the Dead Sea, which is the lowest land point on Earth. It's about 1,410 feet below sea level. That's about the height of a 130-story building, but downwards. Imagine standing on the edge of the Dead Sea. You are literally at the lowest point on the planet. The river rises from its birthplace on the slopes of Mount Hermon, a spot nestled right on the border between Syria and Lebanon. From here, our river flows down south, passing through the northern part of Israel and making its way to the Sea of Galilee. But wait, there's more. Once it exits the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River continues its path toward the south it sort of becomes a border at this point, separating Israel and the West Bank on its west side from Jordan on its east side. And finally, after all that traveling, it finds its resting place in the Dead Sea. Now the Jordan River doesn't make this trip all alone. It gets a helping hand from several other rivers that join it along the way, including the Banyas, Dan, Hasbani, Iyan, Yarmouk, and Zarka Rivers. And did you know that the Jordan River carries a little thing called silt with it? It's kind of like really small bits of sand and dirt. Most of this silt ends up settling down in the Sea of Galilee, and then it moves south from a point called the Daganya Dam. And the Jordan River isn't just going about its business alone. Oh no, it's part of this huge geographic thing called the East African Rift System. Picture this, a massive valley that begins way up in Turkey, runs all the way down through the Red Sea, and then stretches even further into eastern Africa. In this giant rift system, there's a part called the Jordan Valley. Now the Jordan Valley is like this long, skinny dip in the land, usually about six miles wide, though it does get a little narrower here and there. And what's really wild is how deep this valley sits compared to everything around it, especially when you get to the south. It's like it's tucked way down into the Earth's surface. Instead of gentle slopes, the valley's got these steep, rugged cliffs that make the whole place look super dramatic. Plus, you'll find these gorges from smaller streams called wadis that cut through the landscape and really make the whole place something to see. But the river had a greater significance in history. For the communities, it was a lifeline for their livelihoods. Along with that, it's also been a major route for travel and trade. And it's acted like a shield, a natural line of defense giving them a sense of safety. And talking about civilizations, the Jordan River has been a witness to the rise and fall of many. Some of the earliest known societies, you know, like the Canaanites, Amorites, Israelites, they all started and thrived near its banks. Let's not forget about the big names in history that have left their imprints on the Jordan River. From the Egyptians to the Greeks, Romans to Byzantines, and many others, they've all wanted a piece of the Jordan River. These guys recognized how valuable and strategic the river was, and they wanted to control it. But the Jordan River isn't just some cool geographical feature 
or historical landmark. It's also a major player in the religious stories of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. First off, in Judaism and Christianity, the Jordan River isn't just a minor character, it's a star. This is the river the Israelites, led by Joshua, crossed to get to the Promised Land after their exhausting years of wandering in the desert. You know those miraculous stories about the prophets Elijah and Elisha? Many of them happened right on the banks of the Jordan. Then, if you fast forward a little, you'll find John the Baptist using the river as his stage, preaching his heart out and dunking people into the water for baptism. And do you know who the most famous person he baptized there was? Yup, you guessed it, Jesus himself. So, you can see why the river is a super holy site for Christians around the globe. In fact, even today the Jordan River is a top destination for Christians. People from different denominations journey from all over the world to dip into its waters, just like Jesus did. It's really something special. But it's not just Christians who hold the Jordan River dear. Muslims also treasure it as one of the four rivers of paradise, as mentioned in the Quran. And that's not all. The river is tied to several prophets and figures in Islamic tradition, so it's also a pretty meaningful site for Muslims, and the river has been hiding some secrets inside of it as well. In 2021, an archaeological jackpot was found in Jordan's southeastern desert. Here, tucked away for about 9,000 years, was a complex of stone carvings, an amazing peek into our distant past. So what's on these stone carvings? Well, we've got two human-like faces carved into the stone, one of these faces is paired with a depiction of a desert kite, a type of ancient stone trap used for hunting gazelles. Think of it like an early version of a hunting net, but made from stones. In addition to the carvings, the site also features an altar, a hearth, marine fossils, and even animal figurines. It's like a 9000-year-old snapshot of Neolithic life. With these carvings among the oldest known works of art in the Middle East, the whole site suggests it might have been used for hunting rituals back in the day. The people who discovered this amazing site are a team of Jordanian and French archaeologists who have been digging around this region for about a decade. Their project is called the Southeastern Badia Archaeological Project, and it's led by two dedicated archaeologists named Mohammed B. Tarana and Wail Abu Azize. The site they found is in a part of Jordan's southeastern desert known as the Jibal al Kashabiya area not far from the border with Saudi Arabia. This area is known for its desert kites, those ancient stone traps we mentioned earlier. These traps are pretty massive, made of long stone walls that guide prey toward an enclosure where they could be caught and killed. Researchers even call these stone traps the world's oldest large-scale sculptures made by humans. Now, archaeologists have discovered ancient rock carvings at the city of Mosul's monumental Mashki Gate. All of it came to light in October 2021. It was then that our team of archaeologists uncovered this complex of stone carvings. The clues that led them here were several ancient campsites around the desert kites. These campsites were once home to hunters who lived around 9,000 years ago. They found traces of semi-subterranean circular huts where these people would have lived, pottery they would have used, animal bones from their meals, and flint tools they crafted. It's like walking into a Neolithic home. Now, the real stars of the site are two stone carvings, affectionately named Ghassan and Abu Ghassan. Ghassan is the taller of the two, standing at 112 centimeters. He's carved to represent a desert kite mixed with a human figure. Can you picture that? A human-like figure blended with a depiction of an ancient hunting trap. On the other hand, Abu Ghassan is a bit shorter, measuring 70 centimeters, but he showcases a finely detailed human face. Together, these carvings are considered some of the oldest works of art in the Middle East, and they really highlight the skill and creativity of the people who made them. But believe it or not, the finds didn't stop with the stone carvings. The archeologists also stumbled upon a ritual altar stone, a hearth, and an impressively arranged collection of around 150 marine fossils. They even found animal figurines and really nicely made flint objects. But these weren't your everyday items. The scientists reckon these were used for big events, like offering sacrifices and performing rituals. Now, these rituals probably had something to do with hunting, like asking the powers that be for success and plenty. The place was likely a special site dedicated to gazelle hunting, reflecting the spiritual beliefs and social structures of the Neolithic hunters who called it home. And this discovery takes us back to another rattling discovery. This one's a bit different, though. 
It's a 9,000 years old Neolithic village found under the river near Beit Zira, Israel. It's like finding a lost city, but underwater. Around 8,000 years ago, a massive flood swept through the area, raising the water level of the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River. This flood submerged an entire village with its stone houses, pottery, flint tools, and even animal bones, all preserved under the water. So how exactly did we come across this sunken marvel? Well, let us take you on a little journey back in time to the year 2013. That's when a bunch of dedicated archaeologists from the Israel Antiquities Authority and the University of Haifa hit the jackpot. Leading the charge was a certain Dr. Yitzhak Paz. Instead of trekking through a desert or climbing a mountain, they were actually navigating the ancient shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. Their toolkit wasn't just shovels and brushes, but sonar and underwater cameras. As they were scanning the sea floor, something caught their eye. It was a pile of stones that seemed, well, a bit out of place. There was something about them that hinted they weren't just a random formation. The team couldn't just ignore this intriguing clue. Fueled by curiosity and the thrill of potential discovery, they decided to dive in for a closer examination. What they uncovered was nothing short of extraordinary. The submerged ruins of a massive settlement. We're talking dozens of buildings, wells, walls, and even graves. It wasn't just a few scattered ruins. It was an entire village hidden under the water. As they dug deeper, the team unearthed a treasure trove of artifacts. Hundreds of them. There were pottery vessels that once held food and drink. Flint tools shaped by... You're probably wondering, when were people actually living in this place? Well, the village takes us way back to a time known as the Pottery Neolithic period, around 6,400 to 5,000 BCE. This was when people in this neck of the woods started to make pottery and tame animals. Radiocarbon dating tells us that folks lived in the village for about 600 years, from around 6,400 to 5,800 BCE. It's likely they ditched the village just before or after a massive flood. And what's the cultural context of this underwater village near Beit Zera? You see, this village wasn't just some isolated community, it was part of a bigger cultural wave called the Wadi Raba culture. The Wadi Raba culture was a popular trend that was sweeping across the southern Levant during the Pottery Neolithic period. The culture's name comes from a site near Tel Aviv, where archaeologists found similar artifacts and pottery. Think of the Wadi Raba culture as a bridge between two significant periods in human history. On one side, you have the earlier pre-Pottery Neolithic cultures. These people were farming, but they hadn't started making pottery yet. On the other side, you have the later Chalcolithic cultures. These communities were taking leaps forward, developing the use of metal and building more complex social structures. Stuck right in the middle, the Wadi Raba culture had its unique character. Imagine rectangular stone houses with plastered floors and walls. There were stone-lined wells and huge stone structures called dolmens and menhirs, which are like ancient forms of architecture. Their burial practices were also pretty distinctive. They had a tradition of secondary burial, where the bones of the deceased would be moved to a special container called an ossuary, or a stone box known as a cyst. And these folks didn't just rely on one source for their food, they had a diversified economy. They cultivated crops, especially wheat and barley, and raised animals, mainly sheep and goats. They were also hunters, focusing on gazelles and deer, and they were skilled fishers, catching mainly tilapia, not only that, they also gathered wild plants, like figs and olives. So this underwater village near Beit Zira isn't just a collection of old stones, it's a link to the Wadi Rabah culture, and an essential piece of the puzzle in our understanding of the transition from pre-pottery societies to more advanced cultures. But Jordan River had a lot more hiding underneath. It turns out that there's a whole history of bridges hidden under those waters. These bridges span different periods and tell the story of the river's strategic and economic importance. Let's start with the Roman bridge near Gesher. This ancient stone bridge might date back to Roman times, and it's located on the border between Israel and Jordan. You'll find it near the spot where the Yarmouk and Jordan rivers meet. Across the Jordan River, we can see the state of Jordan. This bridge was built by the Jordanians after they took over the area after 1949 in order to connect their capital, Amman, with Jerusalem. The bridge is quite large, stretching 230 feet long. It's designed with a main arch, that lets a steady flow of water pass through, and six smaller arches higher up to help out when the river floods. The bridge shows at least two major phases of construction. The lower level might date back to Roman times, while the upper pointed arches are likely from the medieval period. 
It's gone through a few repairs over the years, including ones during the reign of Saladin in the late 12th century, and another repair in the mid of 13th century. There's even a suggestion that it was built by Mamluk Sultan Barkuk in the late 14th century. Next up, we have the Ottoman Bridge near Damia, also known as Allenby Bridge or King Hussein Bridge. This one's a bit newer, built in 1918 by the Ottoman Empire during World War I. This bridge replaced an older wooden one that had been destroyed by the British forces. It was named after Edmund Allenby, the British commander who led the campaign against the Ottomans in Palestine and Syria. This bridge crosses the Jordan River near Jericho and serves as a connection between Israel and Jordan. It's one of the two border crossings between these countries and has been renovated several times. The most recent renovation was in 1994 after the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty. And we can't wrap this up without mentioning the Mamluk Bridge near Jizr al damia or Jizr al mujamiya or Jizr Usama, as some people call it. This stone bridge goes across the Jordan River, and it's about a 19-mile hop south of the Roman Bridge near Gesher. It was built or spruced up in the late 12th century by a guy named Usama al-Halabi, who was an emir under Saladin. Check this out. The bridge has got three arches, and the one in the middle is a bit larger than the others. And this wasn't just any old bridge. It was part of a big strategic route that connected Damascus and Cairo via Jerusalem and Hebron. The bridge even had a con nearby, like an ancient motel, where travelers could kick back rest and swap goods. This khan, which was built by Mamluk Sultan Baybars in the late 13th century, was pretty fancy. It even had a mosque, a courtyard, and rooms for guests and their animals. So you see, the Jordan River is like a hidden museum of bridges, each with its own unique backstory. But not all the findings were as stunning. Some discoveries have been downright terrifying. We're going to travel back in time for this one, about 1.5 million years to be exact. In 2022, scientists shook the world with a mind-blowing discovery. They had found a human vertebra that old in the Jordan Valley, right near an ancient site called Ubidia. Now this isn't just any random old bone. This vertebra belonged to an ancient human who was part of the second wave of humans making the big move from Africa to Eurasia around 1.5 million years ago. Can you even imagine being part of that journey, stepping into new territories for the very first time? This vertebra is the oldest piece of evidence we've got of ancient humans in Israel, making it kind of like a major checkpoint in our own evolutionary story and cultural history. So, how did these scientists bump into such an extraordinary discovery? The tale begins in 2018. A group of Israeli and American scientists, guided by a dude named Dr. Alon Barash from Bar Ilan University, decided to take another look at some bones that were originally excavated in Ubedia, way back in 1966, by a different group of archaeologists. And Ubedia is an awe-inspiring spot in itself. It's the second oldest archaeological site discovered outside Africa dating back to the same era as the vertebra, around 1.5 million years ago. This place is like a hidden treasure chest from the past. It's packed with stone artifacts, animal bones, and even fossilized plant remains that give us some juicy clues about the environment and the lifestyle of the ancient humans who used to call it home. So, you've got to realize, this 1.5 million year old vertebra isn't just some fossil. It's a personal letter from our ancestors, the brave souls who trekked out of Africa and into Eurasia ages and ages ago. The researchers figured out it belonged to a hominin. And just in case you're scratching your head, a hominin is basically part of the human family tree that includes all of our extinct relatives. Now the big question was, who did this vertebra come from? To crack that mystery, the researchers started comparing it with bones from other animals and hominins. They ended up with a pretty wild conclusion. It came from a kind of human we've never met before, different from the ones found in Georgia. And those are the oldest human remains we've got outside Africa, being about 1.8 million years old. They estimated that this vertebra belonged to a child, somewhere between 6 to 12 years old when they died. This young explorer was about 155 centimeters tall and tipped the scales between 45 to 50 kilograms. It's the oldest evidence of humans in Israel we've found so far, and it's among the oldest in the whole of Eurasia. The discovery of this vertebra also hints at the idea that human migration from Africa to Eurasia wasn't a one-and-done deal. No, it seems there were several waves of adventurous humans venturing forth into the great unknown. And these migrations might not have just involved our direct ancestors, but different species of hominins too. This brings us to another fascinating aspect of this discovery. The vertebra offers new insights into the biology of our ancient kin. It gives us a sneak peek into their physical makeup, 
their growth, and their development. And now we head on over to the eastern bank of the Jordan River. There's a place there that's got an interesting story to tell. It's right where the Jordan meets another river, the Yarmouk. This place is known by a few names, al Magtas or Bethany beyond the Jordan. al Magtas, on the east bank of the Jordan River, is one of eminent spiritual and historic importance. This spot is traditionally believed to be the very place where John the Baptist baptized Jesus. That's right, this site has been held in reverence since the Byzantine period, which, just to give you a sense, was many, many centuries ago. Besides being linked to the story of Jesus and John, al Maktas also has connections to other important religious figures. Ever heard of the prophets Elijah and Elisha? Yep, their lives are tied to this location too. So, it's not just a key location for Christianity, but it holds significance for various monotheistic religions. It's like a shared historical treasure chest, brimming with tales and traditions that overlap and intertwine. Now let's talk about the lay of the land. al Magtas has two primary archaeological zones. The first is known as Tel Al-Karar, which is also dubbed Elijah's Hill or Jabal Mar Elias. The second area is a little closer to the river and it's where the churches of St. John the Baptist stand. These two areas are linked by a flowing stream known as Wadi Karar, sort of a natural pathway connecting the two. And al Maktas isn't just about religious importance, it's also a bona fide archaeological playground. Excavations there have revealed numerous religious structures, including churches, monasteries, baptismal pools, and pilgrim stations, dating from the Roman to the Byzantine periods. Because of its significant heritage, it's been recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. What's more, al Maktas is a buzzing spot for tourism. Every year, thousands of pilgrims and tourists flock to this site, especially on January 6th to Mark Epiphany. It's a place where people from all around the world come to connect with an essential part of their faith. And what's beneath the surface of al Maktas? The archaeologists who've explored this site have unearthed some truly fascinating structures that date back to the Roman and Byzantine periods. One of the first things they found was a water collection system and pools. Now these weren't just for taking a quick dip. They were used for baptism rituals and vital ceremonies in early Christianity. Then there's this special baptismal pool they discovered. Imagine a pool built around a natural spring, decorated with a marble slab shaped like a cross. This is where many ancient baptisms would have taken place. They also found a whole monastery complex. It's a cluster of buildings that includes a large basilica, a courtyard, a chapel, living quarters for the monks, and even a tower. But that's not all. Nestled on this site, there's a cave chapel. It's thought to be the very spot where John the Baptist lived and preached his message. Nearby, there's a church dedicated to St. John the Baptist, originally built by the Crusaders. Later on, it was restored by the Franciscans, a group that continues to play a major role in maintaining Christian holy sites in the Holy Land. Finally, one of the most intriguing spots is a hermitage cave. This place is traditionally identified as the site where the prophet Elijah was taken up to heaven. And that's it for the rattling discoveries in Jordan River we never saw coming. Let us know in the comments what you think about them.